Hey guys, what's up? Welcome to another episode of Coffees for Closers. So we got Anthony, Anthony V, Matt. big man, slappy happy. How's it going, man? Good, brother, good. What we're gonna talk about today is like sales, working as sales sniper, like what we think it takes to be a successful sales guy and uh, make sure you like, subscribe, hit notification, but all that kind of good stuff. Make sure you watch all the way through to the end and we'll see you on the other side. Cue the intro. If you listen to this podcast, you will make your first million within three years. I'm going to repeat that. You will make a million dollars within three years of the first episode you listen to. We don't want pikers. We're not here to save the manatees. We're here to make podcasts. You really want this. You listen and review. Put that coffee down. What's going on, dude? Good man. Just uh, flew in. Landed, what, an hour ago? Straight yeah. to the office. Straight. Ready to roll. Client meeting. Yeah. Go lunch, client meeting, podcast. Straight into it, man. Sales call in 20 minutes. <laughs> Bro. Yeah, we got to keep an eye on the time. Let's do it. So, uh, give us a run through. What do you do here? I'm uh, one of the sales guys, just one of the boring sales guys. Yeah. Manage a few of the accounts as well on the Australian side. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I'm actual sales dude as well. So actually taking calls. Crazy. Cracking necks, slapping checks, helping Crack- a lot of people. Practicing what he preaches. That's it, man. Yeah. A few slaps. Exactly. When needed. What, um, so you were in co- closing for a while. We actually worked together. We did. When we first met, we worked together on an account where you were the internal and our team came in externally to do the USA yep. sales, essentially. Yep. I think we had a pretty good, we had a pretty good relationship. Yeah, I actually learned a lot from you because, well, because like I'd been closing for a long time, but like not in the high ticket space. Right. You've been closing high ticket for longer than I have. Yeah. Right. But I've done 10 years of selling before I did high ticket, you know? And so like, I think like um, the thing that I opened to me when one was you're really good. It's a different type of selling, but I could see it was really good. Yeah. But two, like, I guess like just the way in which you, I don't know if like sales professionalism like you had, you were very processed. Yeah, and I like, think that's one of the biggest things. Like when, when you started, I remember, you know, going through, sending you a bunch of recordings and a bunch of calls. And um, I don't believe at the time, I correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think you were selling with a script at the time. No. You weren't, yeah. yeah. So I remember sending you a bunch of my calls and it was essentially the same call because I was just following a script and I was yeah. very process driven. Yeah. Um, and then, rogue. and then from there, because it was Marco, yourself, and and Will on the account. Yeah. And then um, I think you then adopted the scripting. Yeah. Um, I used your scripting. My scripting. Yeah. Yeah. How did it work out for you? It was really good. It was. Yeah. It was really long. Very long. Yeah. Like very long. Like ninety minutes. <laughs> ninety minutes long. Yeah. Um, Minimum without so, objections. <laughs> yeah. So what I did, I I cut out. Yeah. A lot of it. Um, not a lot of it, but I cut out probably half of it. Because I knew my objection handling was so good, yeah, I knew I could get away with murder until the very end. Yeah, but it really helped me to follow a structure, and that's when I started looking for like different structures, and that's when I found Jeremy. Yeah, so I was looking for like a really structured approach to selling because I adapted that, and I was like, oh man, this makes it way easier. Yeah, like I'd always used a framework, but I never used like an actual script. You know? Yeah, and so by adopting that. I was like, okay, this makes my life a bit easier. And then I started kind of processing everything more and more and more because I was just good at sales. Like yeah. It was just, it was just sort of lots of experience and objection handling and I could yeah. like navigate, but every call was totally different. That's like, what I'll say the difference between me because it was you, you'd get to the end and you're comfortable in your ability to objection handle. Yeah. Me, it was the other way around. Like I was never good at objections. I didn't have 10 years of yeah. experience selling gyms. Like that's the first account I got chucked on. Finish university, straight onto high ticket selling. Yeah, yeah. So I didn't have the mm. the, the gyms and, and all the fitness sales experience. So my calls would go for 90 minutes to two and a half hours. And I remember posting call recordings in the Slack channel. I'd be like, hey guys, I just made a sale. I remember one day you commented back, you and James, you're like two and a half hours, holy moly, or something like that. Yeah. I didn't know any different, but yeah. the difference was about 98% of my closes and I sold, I sold that program like crazy yeah, yeah. were objectionless yeah just did not get objections because yeah. i was just so process driven um but then i found jeremy and that dude I, it actually blew my blew my mind that now i'm closing deals in 30 minutes that took me 90 minutes or two hours yeah but like it just it completely blew my mind yeah i think like um i think i could be wrong one of the driving factors for you wanting to do that was like because you were probably better than i was in terms of like 
the ability to close, especially to close that deal, right? Because you're so processed, it was like you could just smash it through. I was probably like better at objection handling yeah. and certain things, but you were really good at closing that deal, better than I was. That I was just all in. Yeah. Just all in. Yeah. yeah. But then when I started NEPQ, yeah. that all changed. Yeah, man. And so I think like, because you sort of kept in touch every now and then. I was watching, man. Yeah. <laughs> I was watching very closely. I was. Yeah. I remember your first podcast you posted. I was following behind the scenes and then Jeremy's first masterclass where you weren't running it, someone else was. I was following very closely. And then I remember... I remember a, a post you did on Facebook once. Um, you said the the internal sales rep is pretty much dead, and then you gave a bunch of reasons why, and um, gave it a little like. Um, I was like, yeah, it makes sense. Like, you know, you're very reliant on one form of marketing. You don't have the opportunity to work multiple accounts, and then and then you just took off, man. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, where did this guy come from? You just it was like the hockey stick for you. And I, yeah. I, I watched it because I saw you at the start yeah, yeah. when you first started Sales Sniper. Yeah. And then I just saw your growth, man. And I'm like, yeah, I, I, yeah, I've got to be part of that. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. Yeah. What is it like besides that? What is it that kind of, because obviously it was a big deal. Yeah. You've been an account, been providing you with an income, all that kind of stuff. We yeah. don't have to go into the backstory of some of the, the other stuff that was going on there. Yeah. But like, I guess like what was it about? I guess I don't want you to like jerk me off or anything. I mean, if you want to. <laughs> But um, maybe later. Just sort of like from a culture or maybe like a accounts perspective that's yep. drew you to wanted to come over here as opposed to staying in a quite a strong yep. internal coaching business. It was tough, man. Making the decision for me was was tough to do it, and I almost talked myself out of it. I think the biggest thing for me was like I was I I was just I excelled at that account. Like I was really 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 good. You know, great company, great. I guess people, I was working with some really cool people in the office and whatnot. Uh, I just felt a bit stagnant in terms of the growth. Okay, it just gets a bit boring. Okay, what's next? Yeah. Right? yeah. It's just like, how many, how many times can you do the exact same process? How many calls can you do until you just get a bit bored? Like what's next, yeah. right? So like when I had a chat to you, I had a chat to Marco. I think the biggest thing you said to me, you sent me a voice message and you said, hey, 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 mate, hope you're well. This is when I had joined and I had started. It's like, there's two things I care about for you, man. It's like your ability to make as much money as you want, which is big for me because I didn't want that ceiling. I didn't want, you know, my my success being kind of, you know, being pigeonholed. Helpful, yeah. yeah. And then the second thing you said, I'm never going to pigeonhold you in a position um, just because you're making me money. And um, I, I guess, yeah, it was just like I, I'd never heard that kind of before yeah. and it was just good to hear that hey man like you actually care about me and my growth and my ability to move up and I've already seen it man I'm already in I'm, I'm with you now for six months you're already giving me uh, more opportunity managerial kind of positions and yeah just the, the ability for growth man which I've, I've you know seen in six months which is awesome awesome man yeah I think like the, the big thing is for a lot of sales guys out there is like I think salespeople. Well, I think the salespeople are quite loyal to the business that they work for because I think you get so bored in yeah. that it's the best thing ever because you have to because you sell it all the time. And I think that a lot of people pigeonhole themselves to do things that isn't really making them that happy because like they've spent so long selling it that they're sold on themselves. But it's like with that, and I've had conversations. Never had this conversation with you. Maybe I have, but it was like, well, you're that loyal. But if that business person had the opportunity to hire someone who was just as good at sales for half the price, would they do it? And it's like, for me, like I wouldn't. Yeah. Like I've turned down really, really good salespeople just because I don't think there's a, like I don't see the long-term play there. Yeah. Not only from like maybe a money point of view, but I just don't think business has to be fun. Like it really does. And if it's not fun, just don't do it, you know? So I think if you, you have to enjoy who you work with, you have to enjoy where you're going. I think the reason why we've managed to collect such good people is because like we just go, where do you want to go? And like, because if I can create, like if somebody was like, man, I'd love to start my own, like I'm so passionate about herbal tea and I'd love to start my own giant herbal tea conglomerate. And I'd be like, all right, man, like that's weird. But if I can help you do it, do you want to do it here? And they'd be like, yeah. And I'd be like, all right, let's map it out. Like yeah. how far away are we from doing this? You know what I mean? So because like I just think if you have a group and a mix of really good people, then I just don't know how you fail. You yeah. know? And like maybe I forego short-term income 
Like I could pay myself a lot more than what I do. I pay myself pretty well to be fair, but I could pay myself more. But then like that would stop me from being able to get more good people. Like we just got Jimmy and yep. his whole team on board. That cost me 30,000 US a month, right? We just got another sales guy, Jeff back. I had to give him a $10,000 signing bonus. Why is that? Because I was like, I really want you to work for me. Yeah. And I know the situation that's going on behind. So I was like, I will give you a signing bonus. And this is the salary package and yeah. the management and the growth package that I'll give you. Yeah. And it's like, F it's like, you can't say no to it. But it's like, okay, so I'll happily over infrastructure us yeah. and like just collect the best people and just try and like tank the profit margins of this business as much as possible. Well, it, it shows, because man. You can just grow. It's your, it's your growth though. Like, I nearly talked myself out of it. Like, you had to sell me in in yeah. making that jump. Like, yeah. I, I had a chat. We, we, had, we had been speaking about it. And then me, you, and James had a, a Zoom meeting booked in. And I was, pre I was prepared on that Zoom meeting. I don't think I've told you this. But I was going into that Zoom meeting telling you guys, talking myself out of it, saying, hey, I don't think this is the right thing for me. Yeah, right. Because that fear kind of came over. It's like... I'd, I had only known that I would, I would be going from a, an account that, you know, really good account, like uh, really good people I was working with, cool clients and all of that to something new, working from home, different scripting because you said I have to adopt any PQ, which yeah. I wasn't allowed to implement. Yeah. You know, it wasn't like there was so process driven that it's makes sense. Like, it makes sense. It's not broken, don't fix it. Exactly. It's yeah. not broken, don't fix it. And then jumped on the call and then you basically said, hey, man, you got to step up. Like, well, what do you want? Where do you want to be? And Yeah. And it was, uh, it yeah. was good, man. Like, One of the best sales calls I remember ever. getting off the Zoom though, man. I was like, I was like, did I just, did I just agree? Cause you're like, you're in, you're in. I'm like, all right, I'm in. Yeah. I couldn't go back on my words. So yeah. Got you in that congruence frame. You did. No, you really did. You got me in the congruence frame. And I said to you, hey man, now I know, I now know what my clients feel like when they're in fear. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting though. Cause I think like difficult decisions are difficult for a reason. Yeah. You know, it's really hard when you don't have to make the decision, right? Like when I started Sales Sniper, I was in a really bad position. So I was like, man, I need to figure something out. So I was like, F I just started doing stuff, hoping the activity would create something. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And then like, but I was not in a good position. Like I, I so I keep my wallet in my left hand pocket, even though I'm right handed but most of the time, because I had a pair of jeans that had a hole in the right hand pocket. Right. And I couldn't afford to buy new jeans. Yeah, so wow. I just started having my wallet in my other pocket. Now it's ingrained in you. Yeah, so I just had it in my left. Yeah, because I had those jeans for f***ing ages. The jeans I wore. That's like what happens when you have a heavy wallet, though, man. It puts holes yeah, in your exactly. pocket. So I actually don't blame you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, you know that might be the case these days, but it's definitely not the case back then. Yeah, sweet man. So, like, I guess, like, as a, like, what are your, like, where do you want to go? Like, where do you, where, what are your, you know, I know some of it, but yeah, you know, for the people at home, like, where, where do you see yourself in, say, a years time? Like, what are the things that you want to sell or? Do you want to move out of selling and move into more development? Like, what's what's the one three year picture for? You know? Yeah, and I know we've had a few chats about this. Um, definitely see myself doing more like of the managerial. Uh, that interests me. Like business interests me. Yeah, yeah. So like learning from you, like someone that's in eighteen months has been able to you know turn two businesses into you know a million a month. If I'm allowed to say that. Um, yeah. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Um, probably more now but yeah just learning like the business side of things and i think like you know y your dad david's like been awesome as well so just learning from him and then learning from some of your mentors as well and then just doing more of the the fun stuff man like at the moment we're closing six figure deals you know in one deal so doing more of the big big sales um but yeah man just just growing personally not just being seen as the sales guy yeah that's just going to be on the phone just banging out deals all day every day like it can yeah. be boring i think i think there's an element where like for i think for a while like you want to have that element yeah you know what i mean but i think like if you once you expand your vision of what sales is like if, if we expand it to persuasion yeah you know what i mean like i've persuaded seven people to give me equity in their business this year yeah right so it's like i might not be on the phone selling i'm close to a pretty decent sized deal last week Pretty small, um, man. I don't yeah. know. <laughs> what was this? Yeah. 775 US. Yeah. It's yeah. pretty yeah. tiny, man. Okay. Lift your game. And I had to actually sell that. Yeah. Right? But like most of my selling is like convincing good sales reps to come on board or it's convincing, you know, accounts to upsell or stay or trying to get what I want out of the account. You yeah. know what I mean? Like I want to onboard three new reps and like, oh, we don't know. So I have to, like it's all about persuasion, right? So, and the persuasion 
like it leads to us being able to make decisions and it leads to us being able to get what we want out of the accounts, which means we can grow the business so we can do all those things. And then just getting really good people on board. Like I think, you know, f- man, we've like Thanos collecting stuns over here. We're just going after everyone. You're tearing it up now. Yeah, bro. Everyone yeah. better watch out, We're man. going hard in the paint right now. Recruitment drive. I don't know, whatever Sean Ray's doing, he's going hard. Something's working, man. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's, it's funny, like I'm fully transparent. Like yeah. uh, I was telling someone the other day, he's like, how do you collect them? It's like, well, if I need accounts, all I have to do is talk about return of ad spend. Yeah. Right? And then I have to do is show all the things that we have, which shows like the volume of sale, the high cash collection, and the good return of ad spend that we have. Yeah. Sales reps don't care about that. Mm. Sales reps care about the size of the deal. Mm. So then when I want sales reps, I just keep posting about the sizes of some of the deals that we close. And then everyone goes, what are you guys selling over there? I go, come find out. Yeah. And more then, more yeah. than that, Matt, I want to ask you because like more than that, it's like you've created a really awesome culture and- most of our guys are remote as well. So yeah. like, what are you actually looking for in a, in a rep? Um, what, like, first of all, what, what did you see in me that made you want me to come over? Cause I know we, we had, we had spoken in the past, but what do you look for in a rep to, to, you know, fuel that culture that you've, mm. you've created? I think like trainability is a good one. So that's why I would, like, so work ethic is first. So we put them through that boot camp, right? So we can see if they actually have like the inbuilt work ethic cause you can't teach it. Yeah. Someone's it can be amazing and lazy. It's like, it's not going to work out. Right. So work ethic is number one. The second thing is then like, do they just fit in with the people that are around them? So like, are they going to be like a good social, socially, are they like good to work with? So we have meetings. Them, so it's like Candace will have a meeting. Sean will have a meeting. Ben and Marco will have meetings and I'll usually meet them or James will meet them. So it's like, looking for any sort of red flags in terms of like social because you can kill a culture with one bad person yep like you so you got to be really careful to you that lend so the last thing we probably look at is skill set mm. because almost all the people that come on are going to come on as a charlie and the reason for that is is that we can get them young and we can get them when they have very very low financial responsibility so they can make not much money and be comfortable yeah and then we can instill the work ethic the culture and the skill set in them over a period of time. Because like, if you look like it takes most guys a year to get good enough to where they're like closing, say, you know, a decent amount to where they can make a good living, right? Like it took me a year to get road to where he is. You know what I mean? And that now he's obviously been doing it for longer than that, but now he's awesome, right? But like from woe to go, that's kind of what it took. And so, the cool thing is with that is like I got to train all of the first guys and all those guys are still here. Yeah. Right. So now like all those guys are trained by me. So like I got to instill my culture, my work ethic, my skill sets into them. And then they took that and ran with that in their own ways. And now they've become the leaders. Will Odoms, Road, Marco, you know, all, all those dudes who've just been around. Like Road has been here. Road, Tony and Tony as well. Those four have been here for like two years. Like Will was like the third sales rep we got. I think Road was the fourth and Tony was the fifth. You know? And they're all savages. They're all really good. Really good, yeah. You know? And so now they're sort of like leadership team that kind of trickle down and they have all have different sort of roles in sales and then you've come in as well. You came in as a known skill set element. Mm. And then I just always liked you. I thought you were a good dude. Um, we only spoke a few times. Yeah. Well, must have made a good impression. Yeah. And so I was like, man, he'd be really good at that. And I think you would reach out to me every now and then yeah. just saying something nice. Hey, man, this is that part. I thought it was really good. You know what yeah. I mean? Just nice stuff. So I was like, oh, man, I think a good, cool dude. And so, yeah. And then I think like when we got the opportunity, I was like, F- man, like Anthony is a killer. Like we need a killer in Australia. Someone who's a proven element, really, really good. And also like for you, it was like you've been in the back of a – coaching business for a long time I yeah was like, so you have some insight that mm-hmm. i don't have because i've never spent a really long time in the back end of one business so there's all these like other elements that you kind of bring to the table which we can use in all the businesses that we work in and now that you're in seventh level as well like seventh level is a really established really good coaching company so it's like you can bolt on into there and everything's pretty yeah. much seamless you know what i mean so yeah i think like culture is number one you know so if they're a good culture fit like, if you want to have a beer with them, that's good. If you don't want to have a beer with them, f- straight away. See you later, bye. Uh, make them go through a boot camp. So make it hard for them, but make it fair. Yep. The people who come on the other side, they're probably going to be a pretty good, pretty good fit. And then just make them work themselves on the chain. 
mm. which means that like all of our recruitment starts from the bottom up. It just makes it way easier. Yeah. We do get some really high, really, really good guys that we just get, but most of those guys have been in our ecosystem for a while. Yeah. So it's like, we know they're a good culture fit. We know they're good closers. They've been in inner circle for a year. You know, they're getting great results. And it's just like, now we have accounts that are just super appetizing. So it's like, here you go. Like, you know, we have heaps of e-com accounts that are doing six figure deals and stuff like that. So yeah, man. it just becomes really Exciting. appetizing to the guys who are like, they want to be the sales guy. And then we're super transparent with like, where do you want to be in a year? Because like, if you don't want to be on the phones in a year, like, I just need to know that. That's the biggest, I think that's the biggest difference. Like you asking questions, how much money you want to make? And like, where do you want to be in a year? Yeah. Where? I just think, um, you know, there's some people are in businesses that they'll never have that type of conversation. So when they meet you and, and you, that's the first thing you ask them, it's just like, all right, now I'm, I know I'm, 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 at, I'm at the right place, but I'm surrounded by people and culture that's going to look after me, you know? Yeah. Not just awesome. look at me as a dollar sign. So, yeah, which I think yeah. is a position that a lot of salespeople get themselves in. Yeah. So you have a sales call though. So I do, man. Crush it. Thanks, guys. I uh, hope you enjoyed the podcast. Make sure you like, subscribe, hit the notification, but all that kind of good stuff. Check us out at salesniper.net, wherever it is you can do. Make sure you comment down below. Say thanks to Anthony, and we'll see you later, guys. Bye. Thanks, guys. James is still in the States doing absolutely nothing productive whatsoever. Shout out to Big James. I don't know, growing, man, growing. and Buying a house in Sydney. and. <laughs> <laughs> Buying a house in Sydney, moving to Sydney. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we'll see, we'll see. He's trying to sell me on that, so we'll see if he gets it across the line. Yeah. Oh, that was good, man. Thanks, man. I appreciate it.